going to get started, so thanks for coming. Just a uh, note about the time is that from the, for the rest of the semester, we'll be starting at, as usual, 4.30 uh, in this room. And uh, you can look on, online. We have uh, a, list of, a list of many good speakers this semester, uh, starting today with Nassim Taleb from NYU, who's going to talk about some, uh, some problems with probability. Oh, thank you. I thought in philosophy department, usually they have much longer introductions. So I'm not a philosopher. Like, uh, all right, that's it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm, uh, there's three problems with probability I've been uh, working on. I'm going to start with the most technical, and then we'll get to the less technical ones. All right. They're technical, but can be explained um, in, in plain English. And also, what is quite central is they affect practically everything that you see. All statistical data and analysis that you see around you are affected by that. So the first problem is fat tails. But before I get there, they're also all connected. The second one is going to be past dependence, uh, what I mean ergodicity. And the third one is fragility, is that effectively, uh, the third one is that We've known about probability forever, and uh, we've dealt with it by changing exposure that rather than changing understanding probabilities better. This is why we hire a lawyer. And uh, when we get to fragility, I'll, sh I'll show how for a long time people understood clipping tails. You hire a lawyer to put a clause in a contract if you're an insurance company that there is cause majeure, you declare cause majeure or you declare whatever you want to declare, it's in your contract, so you don't have to understand the statistical properties of the tail, and that protects you. So it's much cheaper to hire lawyers than run computers, <laughs> or, or have big data. So that was, that's the third point. And of course, it's a um, definition, it's all linked to fragility and exposure. The three are linked together. Before we start, I have one question, so we can see why we can't really talk about probability without talking about error rate, you're in a philosophy department, if someone tells you this event has zero probability of happening, and you ask him or her how did they derive, you know, what that statement comes from, and uh, the person answers, Baal told me, you know, you have a deep, profound, religious belief in Baal, and Baal told you that probability is zero, all right? So, you know, you may say, okay, it's not empirical, but it is not inconsistent. But if someone tells you the probability is zero, and you ask the person, how do you know? And, and he or she answers, I estimated it. Okay, what is the problem? <laughs> Where is the inconsistency? That will bring us to the problem of induction, okay? What is the consistency? How can you estimate something and not have an error rate? If you've estimated it, it cannot be zero. So small probabilities, if you have an estimation error, are higher, simply because you have to have a margin of error, all right? What does the margin of error do to something that's zero? Brings it up. If it's one, brings it down. That's convexity. Probability is in it there is convex to estimation errors, or lack of knowledge, or uncertainty. So that's sort of the idea, the central idea that has been, I've been working on forever, but not in a very technical form. Till I finally figured out how to phrase it in a convincing way, okay, in a less unconvincing way. So that's the idea, that you can figure out where the error, the, the error can be asymmetric. It's the same problem as when you take uh, plane ride from here to Athens. Okay, how long is the, uh, the ride from here to Athens? Eleven hours. Eleven hours. Okay. Um, okay. So if you have, if they, if there is more uncertainty, is the ride going to be shorter? Maybe by ten, fifteen minutes. Okay. Can it be longer by two hours? Can you arrive a late? Sorry. It actually happened to me once. Uh, one, only once. All right. I've been crossing the Atlantic. Uh, uh, long enough to, to uh, one, uh, once landed two weeks later. It was exactly uh, uh, caused by an event that happened 16 years ago, all right? It was exactly September 11, all right? So I, I landed, uh, so you, you realize that you can have an error take you in one direction more than the other. 
And that's what I call convexity or fragility. We'll get to that later, unless you invite me back next year and I continue. Let me now stick to fat tails, okay? Now, fat tails, uh, what are fat tails? Very hard to explain fat tails. Uh, problem of fat tails. We have a whole research program on fat tails, okay? So the, uh, I started with a bunch of friends saying, okay, if there's fat tail this in the data, what consequences are there? A lot of people give lip service, say, hey, we know about fat tails. I know that you know about fat tails, okay? But if you know anything about fat tails, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, all right? It's not changing the color of the dress. <laughs> See, it's not like saying, okay, we're gonna change the color from blue to green. We're gonna say it's fat tailed. The entire statistical framework changes. The entire reasoning changes. The entire functioning of law of large numbers is now in, 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 in jeopardy, okay? So things happen differently under fat tail. So this is what I've been working on technically. And then our program started two and a half years ago and we published a lot of papers. Uh, one in, um, two on <coughs> estimation of inequality, on Gini, for example, how under fat tails their thing doesn't work. I had, uh, I don't know if you know about my fight with uh, Steven Pinker on violence. Well, it comes from the fact that his metrics don't work on the fat tails. <laughs> you see, you need much more data. So let's see how, okay? How and, and what, first, what are fat tails? Um, and, and it's all connected visibly, is, or you have much larger area where you have fat tails. And I try to be a little philosophical here with things, but let me start with the, the beginning, from the beginning, all right? Everything in statistics is based on cheating the problem of induction that you philosophers all right are extremely sensitive about okay and cheating it how by claiming that under some regularity condition under this under this under this understanding of the process uh, stationarily whatever it is there's something called the law of large numbers okay and the law of large numbers tell you that as your sample increases your confidence about what is being derived okay is greater no so it, it effectively, you start becomes almost deterministic because the variance of the average drops, okay, commensurately, okay? So that's the law of large numbers under a Gaussian distribution or other distribution. We're gonna define fat tails in a few minutes. We're gonna see what it is. And this is how it functions under a distribution that has fat tails. Now you're gonna tell me, yeah, we don't care about fat tails, they don't exist. We're gonna tell you that Pareto 80-20 when you ask people to give you a statistical distribution, they give you automatically a parameterized one, Pareto 80-20, 20% of the people in Italy have 80% of the land and vice versa, okay? So, or 20% of the people in Rutgers philosophy department contribute to 80% of the output and vice versa, <laughs> or they would, uh, which actually, if you recurse, becomes 1% contributes to 50%, okay? because the 20% are also 80-20. So you recurse and then you get that, okay. So for example, and this is a very simple example of that one, the 80-20, okay. To tell you how much more data you need to figure out what's going on, unless you do something a little differently by no longer talking about observations on average and moving to a different space, which is parameter space on that later, okay. So. The best example I can give of the law of large numbers, of, of the difference between the two, oh, wait, okay, this is uh, type one, type two distribution. This one is the one I resorted to recently, is you have the following thought experiment. And I'm not gonna show you the slide now because you're gonna figure out this thought experiment and answer it. I randomly select from the population of the planet two people. My sample is an outlier. The total height of these two people is four meters and uh, uh, 20 centimeters, right? And it's com completely IID, in other words, they're not both from the Rutgers uh, basketball team, okay? So like from the planet, all right? I have an outlier. What's the most likely distribution of the height of these two people? One meter and three meters, sorry? One average person and one very tall person. No. For a, any distribution that is thin tail, actually that's the very definition, 
okay? The most, when you go, the further you go in the tail, the more likely your event comes from both. <laughs> so in other words, for a Gaussian, you're much more likely to get two times three sigma sample than one time six sigma. You see? All right. And the very definition of fat tail, the borderline, is when that flips. And you have a basin. As your number goes to infinity, all right? As you're, you're, in other words, you're going to the tail of the total sample. So this is, we call that sub-exponentiality, all right? So when I do that here, uh, it, it actually height is almost Gaussian or whatever distribution has this, you know, similar to the Gaussian. So the, you can, uh, the most likely visibly is 4.1 meters, it's, it's half and half, okay? So, but when you, if you have the same story with someone very wealthy, with, okay, with, sorry, you, you randomly select two people and you have the tails, a total net worth of $36 million, what's the most likely combination? 18 and 18? No, something like 36 and zero, <laughs> or 36 minus $500 and 500, something like that, okay? So you get the idea of, of, so this gives us an idea about, I mean, why in finance, I've been all my life saying you cannot use traditional tools, okay? Because of that. This is something you actually, after a while, figured out that someone had to have worked on it and have Cramer. Cramer figured it out for insurers. If you're insuring thin tail events, namely how many people are gonna have car accidents and stuff like that, okay? To have a tail event, it gotta come from a lot of people having a lot of problems, all right? But, the, but, but when you talk about fat tails, then one event is gonna cause everything. If you lost a billion dollars in a bank, it's probably it didn't come from 100 losses. It came from one large one. So that's the difference between these, uh, between these two domains. So, the, uh, and of course, there's uh, the mathematical differences. So now, so far, a lot of people would, if you quiz them, what are fat tails, they almost get that. The point is the consequences. If you think about it in terms of consequences, it means you no longer can use some classes of distributions as a proxy for other classes of distribution, okay, for some applications. Fat tails means that the contribution of the large deviation dominates the total properties. Okay, so we no longer even in probability space because it, it's not that they have a small probability of happening, <laughs> it's that their impact is very big. So, and actually, a lot of people make mistakes. They say fat tail means tail events have higher probability. Not true. Fat tail is actually tail events have lower probability. It also suffice that one in the extreme tail has has one payoff. Now, so this so far is known, but now let's go start going into the consequences, okay? This is the definition, the mathematical definition, we call it the catastrophe principle, but let's forget about the math, we don't need the math to understand it. We have a very two crisp domains. As a deviation, you know, as a total piano goes, a sum has an extreme deviation, the contribution of the, of the things, all right, got to be one or the other, okay? Now, it so happens that we have, God invented probability distributions, you have statistics department, and they work with them, okay? So now we have, the only problem I have is last time I lectured at Rutgers, nobody spoke with a New Jersey accent. And yet we have, what we have here is what up there? Forget about it, all right? And nobody got the joke last time, all right? And I have a whole character in my book, Anti-Fragile and Black Swan from New Jersey, Fat Tony, all right? So, so let me, so let's say what's a, we'll forget about it. In other words, you really can't do nothing statistically, almost not, nothing, all right? But before that, uh, Let's look at distribution. We start with degenerate. A degenerate distribution means very simply that all observations are 44. What is it in that movie, in that uh, book? 42? <laughs> 42. So all observations are, what, are the same, okay? Degenerate distribution, or it's the equivalent of a, say, a, 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 a scale uh, 
distribution in the location scale family with a, with a variance going to zero, all right? With a, with a scale going to zero or something like that, okay? And then you go a little higher, Bernoulli is plus one, minus one, or whatever, zero, one, okay? So it is thinner tail, than, then you have a Gaussian reached from below, in other words, a sum of binomials, uh, sorry, increased binomials, sum of Bernoulli, random walk, reached from below, okay? The traditional one, you reach a Gaussian that really doesn't have infinite realization unless n itself goes to infinity, okay? And so sum of summons, number of summons goes to infinity. So thin tail. Then you get Gaussian from approximation, a genuine Gaussian, all right? It's something you approximate with a Gaussian, not reached via the law of large uh, the central limit, but reached naturally or obtained naturally. And then you have that sub exponential class, the log normal enters here. Log normal, as we'll see, ah, at some parameterization. And this property is asymptotic. So the problem, again, that we have with probability of statistics is that when people talk about summons, when, stati when, when, when math mathematical statistician talks about summons, for them, there are only three worlds that exist. One is n of one, <laughs> one is n of two, sometimes, all right, for some who want to be practical, and one is n infinity. In between n of 30, the pre-asymptotics, they have no clue, all right? So, this is why you ignore that misfunctioning of large, large numbers, because at infinity you get a lot of large numbers, all right? But you don't get it in between. <laughs> you see, we, we know, they tell you, yeah, yeah, if you sum up Gaussians, you get, uh, uh, by central, if you sum up distribution with, with finite variance, okay, you don't get it in real time. Anyway, so large, large numbers w in, in real time works here, in the yellow. We have convergence issues, pre-asymptotic problems. Once you enter the power law class here, the white is a power law class, and there exists something, the borderline is levy stable alpha, you see, of, of, of levy stable alpha less than two, and then alpha less than one is the forget about it. Because you will never observe anything except probability. You never observe any other statistical proper, uh, property than probability. So forget about it means there's no mean? There's no mean, there's no variance, there's no skewness, there's no this, no that. Okay, but there's probability. <laughs> All right, because it adds up to one, and I was told that even at Rutgers in the stat department, it adds up to one, no? All right, so we're, we're safe. So, so this is what I, we've been working on. Now, the, the point is, so far, but some consequences on stuff done wrong, okay? So let's continue. The first thing that immediately just to mind is there's a fellow called Markowitz who came up and fucked up finance, sorry, messed up finance completely, all right? With his portfolio thing. And the, the idea is this is mean absolute deviation because now we're gonna go here, there's a class that has a mean but no variance. You can still work with them. And they don't converge to Gaussian, they converge to Levy stables, find very respectable distribution. So with very respectable territory, the law of large numbers works. So we're here. This is the number of observation for Gaussian. Okay. You start off with a you calibrate to an equivalent mean deviation. For the blue one, it's very slow. Okay. And of course, for a Cauchy with alpha of one, or or a you know, Levy stable alpha of one is flat. In other words, the variance never drops under, under aggregation, all right? Which means there's no variance, but uh, okay. So, there's one thing here to note, is that now instead of thinking temporally, think in ensemble. I am adding stocks that are independent, okay? People have the illusion that the risk drops like this. And that's Markowitz. No, if, I, if, if the risk doesn't drop. So now let me give you a very simple quiz. Very, not quiz. How long would it take this blue one, all right, for the parameterization, 80-20, okay? In other words, how large a sample, if I want a sample as well behaved, you see, with, with the thing with large, large numbers, is my sample does this. As I'm adding observation, okay, it becomes, you know, 
my average becomes small, it fluctuates less and less. Okay, now how, if I need 30 for the Gaussian, I don't know whether someone got 30 out of some, somewhere, all right? So some statistics books, uh, 30, you can approximate the z-score by me score whatever it is, okay? So the 30 for the Gaussian, how many do you need for an 80-20? The most discussed probability distribution on the planet. How much data do you need to have the same, the same drop in, uh, in variance? Five times? 10,000. 10, 10 to the 14th times more okay so in other words forget about it really when we talk about the mean even if it exists okay even if it exists you're not going to observe it is it still working okay if you're not going to observe it in real time okay so we got to find some other tricks for that so the uh Uh, here is here is the data, okay? No, so 10 to the 14 here, or 10 to the 13 if it's skewed, okay? This is a parameterization. This is why I have forget about it at one, which is, again, nobody's proud of New Jersey uh, terms, linguistic term filtering into the vocabulary of statistical uh, rigor, no? All right, so this is, forget about it as a New Jersey rigor. And then, and then we have the equivalent, in other words, 30 for a Gaussian, how much more than 30 do you need? Okay? All right, so that tells us something about fat tails, okay? But it also tells us something about statements made. So, we, so I spent my life as a trader, all right, 21 years as a trader, knowing where that it was not Gaussian, and knowing what, how to trick things to figure out where the mistakes are going to be, okay? And visibly the mean is going to be a mistake, but there are other tricks. And also we got to know where there's more mistakes and where there are fewer mistakes. And, and eventually, we should remind me to talk about the hurricane. I don't have it on the slides here. So since we have philosophers here, so let's talk about the masquerade problem and link it to that table, all right? With the yellow, the white, and the forget about it, or the extra white, all right? If I have a degenerate distribution, that's the black swan problem, the classical black swan problem, all right? If I have degenerate distribution, okay, can I refute from past observation that it's not degenerate? Can I, I mean, please, sorry? No. No, I cannot from past observation. But if I, because I, if I see one additional variation, a jump here, then what can I answer? Yes, it's stochastic, no? I can say it is stochastic. I cannot say it is not stochastic. All right? So there is a hierarchy of terms I could use. Okay? It's more rigorous to say it is stochastic. All right? Than say it is degenerate. And here you know it's not degenerate. If you see it changing, you, see it, you know it's not degenerate. In that sense. Okay? So it can take more than one value. In other words, I've seen a black swan. I know that all swans are not white. So it is rigorous to say they are black swans, okay? It is not rigorous to say all swans are white, okay? But now with the same classification, let's work, walk it through that table, okay? And we can walk through that, the, make it, filter it upward in the table by saying as follows, all right? I have layering of distribution. If I see a jump, I can rule out that it's Gaussian. <laughs> I can rule out that it's thin-tailed. Okay, I cannot rule out that it's fat-tailed. In other words, I cannot say there's evidence that the data is thin-tailed. I can say there is evidence the data is not Gaussian, or not thin-tailed, you see? It's much harder for a thin-tailed distribution to deliver a 20 sigma, you see, than for it, the probability, if I see a, a Gaussian a distribution, say, the stock market, stock market crash of 1987. A 20 sigma event, what's the probability of a 20 sigma? 10 to something obscene, all right? I mean, I'm not gonna say it because, it's, you know, it's just the computer, what I remember in 87, 30 years ago, would blow up on that number, okay? So we, we didn't know what the probability was, we knew it was obscenely low, all right? Okay, so what is it, it's more likely for us to have the wrong model, or for the probability to be one in, uh, 
10 to the 50. <laughs> so visibly, it's much more likely that we have the wrong model. So this is how we can start having hierarchy of statements. And this is the kind of thing I put here, I brought here to you know, convince my philosopher uh, hosts that there is that the methods of layering distribution is effectively compatible with everything philosophers do, which is namely asymmetry, asymmetry of statements. All right, so, so questions here because I, I guess we're we're going to go with the Q and A during or no? Yeah. Yes. Can you repeat the last two sentences? Yes. When 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 philosophers are very sensitive to asymmetry of statements, if I make a statement, all swans are white. Okay, it's, it is not rigorous. But if I say, not all swans are white, it's more rigorous, you agree? Yeah, sure. Okay, so here I'm saying, if I say it's fat-tailed, it's uh, 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 more rigorous than saying it is, there's evidence of thin tails. Right. Because all I need is one observation to destroy everything about thin tails. <coughs> fat tails are actually, if you put this back in statistical terms, are there statisticians in the room, or other than Harry and the others? Or mostly philosophers. Okay, we have something we call the break break point for distribution. Okay, if the the one single observation can change the whole distribution, all right, depending for what for the probabilities, no. Okay, for the the median, it doesn't change with one observation when the n is large, but the moments change with one observation, th namely the mean, and that's a robust statistics uh, statement. Okay, so the uh, so. Now let's look at a very simple consequence that people don't get about, um, about uh, in, in, the, uh, in the naive empiricism that takes place in psychology literature. The psychology literature would make anyone who likes probability any remotely cry. All right? But let's, let, me make, let me make you cry with a very simple statement. Okay? Now, look at, you see this picture <coughs> that all these people who are into rationalism, all kind of crap called rationalism, which is the, the least rational thing I think of, it's just all they're telling me they don't understand probability, all right? They tell you that more people have slept with Kim Kardashian than more Americans have slept with Kim Kardashian than have died of Ebola, all right? Okay, now, me, that's a statement where you're comparing two different means, no? But why compare the means? Because we're not interested in the means when we talk about Ebola. When you talk about Ebola, what are you interested in? The tail. Well, there's something called Chernoff bound. The Chernoff bound for very thin tail distribution, low on my thing, it tells you the probability of something, it's sort of like the Markov bounds, all these Chebyshev bounds and stuff like that, but it puts tr strong bounds on thin tailed probability, on deviation for thin tailed probability. For the mean to double, from one year for something to double, the probability is one and again, something obscene, 10 to the obscene number, or 10 to the 10 or something like that. Whereas if I tell you the probability that Ebola's numbers would double, do you have the same bounds? No, why? Fat tail distribution will have the same bounds. And even more interesting, now if you think about it the way we do in it with extreme value theory, there's a group of people who do extreme value theory and let's talk about, we're going to talk about what, what, how we look at extremes. The way you compare things for risk purpose is not mean to mean, but tail to tail. So let's say that you read the newspaper, you go on hibernation or philosophy seminar, prolonged philosophy seminar, for five years, or for one year. One year is sufficient, no? Okay. And then you're fed up with it, you come back to Earth, all right? and you open the New York Times or whatever people read here, okay, so if it's still around, it's not bankrupt, all right, you read the New York Times and you have a headline, total uh, casualty, number of casualties is 100 million. What's the disease likely to be? Alcohol, tobacco, or, you know, cancer, or Ebola? Sorry? <laughs> Kid what, sorry? Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian, all right. So, so, or, uh, so 100 million people cannot die of a thin tail distribution. Terrorism can kill, war can kill. So when you look at it from the tail, so you gotta make, look at things, compare tails from a tail, all right? So look at it, conditional on a tail event happen, what's the most likely? 
So this is the other thing. And again, the, the thou shall not compare multiplicative, right, fat-tailed processes to thin-tailed, non-multiplicative ones. Epidemics are multiplicative. You know, a third of Europe died of the plague. So, but a third of Europe cannot die of cigarette smoking. <laughs> or lung cancer or something like that. Insurance companies know that very well. One is thin-tailed, the other is fat-tailed. It's the same as catastrophe principle. Simple application. Now, you start debating, I, I enjoy, um, I, I have one thing, I, I don't tell people I go to the gym, but I don't, when I lift weight, I don't use Twitter, but when I use a Stairmaster, I get into Twitter fights, because that keeps me, you know, doing things, entertained. So I get in Twitter fights with people, journalists, and they tell you we have evidence that Ebola doesn't kill, and we have evidence that we should worry more about people dying in their bathtub, like uh, Steven Pinker. He's, he, if Steven Pinker, you can pick him as a guy who's wrong on everything. So if he has an argument, so someone forwarded to me the argument that he was saying that more people died in their bathtub or drowning in the pool, some silly thing, in America than died of terrorism. That's fine, but first of all, your bathtub is not trying to kill you. <laughs> and but uh, terrorism is low because we have measures against terrorism. The second one is your bathtub is not going to kill, cannot kill 20,000 people, right? But terrorism can. So it's misplaced. So there are comparisons between processes that should not be done by smart people, yet educated people tend to make these mistakes more than your grandmother. This is what's shocking. Your grandmother had better instinct for these things. Okay, so. I guess. Maybe that last sentence good, catches it, but I mean, maybe because your grandmother has common sense, right? But in order to, uh, is there an empirical way to know that something's got to happen? Yes, yes, very simple. Uh, tonight you're inviting me to dinner, no? Okay. Uh, is it, okay, I'm going to overeat. How many calories can I eat? 3,000. 3,000, all right. Okay, I consume about a million calories a year. I'm almost a New Jersey guy, all right. <laughs> so is, it, is one day gonna make a dent in my yearly uh, thing? No, the, is, is one day gonna make me more of a, uh, no, thinner? I skip a meal tonight, will I be thinner? Okay, can you lose your fortune in a day? Okay, there we go, it's fat tail, thin tail. <laughs> See, you look at, you look at, the way you look at it, you gotta look at the extreme event, all right? You lost 50% of the, the asset in one, or something in one day. What can it be? All right? If, if, if you can, portfolio can lose 50%. Your weight, you can't lose 50% without amputation, you see? So. so it seems to be, well, that, that's true that you can lose your fortune in one day, right? But I think that what the, uh, the fake empiricists would say is that, well, I've been in the stock market my whole life. I've never seen such a fluctuation. Yeah, so on that later, on that later, right? Okay, we got, I've seen enough bankrupt people give that argument before they get bankrupt. <laughs> right. uh, the problem is survivorship bias. Of course, they're going to give you the argument before. But the, the point is, we know that you have enough ways to figure out if data is fat tailed. Yes. There's, there's a power law class. I mean, we can discuss later, but let me put uh, uh, the power law class. If, if there are, are very, very easy ways to do it. If I had my computer, it would be simple. I could just show you a la carte how to do it. So, the, uh, this is The Economist, which is why you should never read The Economist. All right. And now, there's another thing, is the problem, and, and, and I'm glad I'm talking about it now, um, because people for example, come up with, oh, that look, we never had uh, more rain in the history of Houston, hence the climate has changed. I I'm not disagreeing that climate may have changed, but it's not on the basis of that remark. And this I call, in the black swan, the problem of, uh, there's a mental block people have in, th in, in not understanding the, the dynamics of extremes. They think that the worst in the data is the worst that can possibly happen. When in fact, as if the data didn't continually, continuously deliver no maxima, you see? To give you an example, uh, the, the Egyptians used to take the high water mark of the Nile, not realizing that it can be exceeded. <laughs> and people stress test their portfolio to the worst historical, not realizing that it can be exceeded, okay? 
but, but by definition, a maxima, all right, is a dynamic thing, okay, <laughs> not a static thing. So we've got to have higher maxima. So, but the people who understand that very well are people in who do hydrology because that's where extreme value theory was born. They live in uh, the Netherlands and they need, you know, to build things higher than past maxima, all right. But by how much? Hence the industry started, okay? Extreme value theory. So let's analyze this. As someone say historical data suggests that the base rate for severe single day stock market crash is relatively low. Well, visibly, these are finance bullshitters, professors of finance. And, and they, are, they don't understand that they're not using fat tailed <laughs> methods to derive that information, okay? L just like someone looking at the, the at the rain in Houston, uh, and let's see how do you do it, okay? Le le let's look at how do you do it. For statistical truth tail is not in a past tail, particularly in some exponential class. <laughs> you have to extrapolate. Tail risk is more significant to set, uh, okay, there's, and one needs to count cumulative drawdown as well as one period exposure. Uh, this is, these are the complex methods, but let's simplify, let me simplify what you do here. The first one is, you take the stock market crash from 1987 and see how it fits. And you see the data fits here on a log log plot with a line. This is fat tailedness. Thin tail does this. These are probability exceeding. And th th this is, sorry, this is a, the number. This is probability exceeding on the log log plot. If you plot things log log plot, thin tail has this. Okay? Uh, the other thing is some people tell you, well, if you look at daily return, the fat-tailed monthly return, thanks to central limit, becomes thin-tailed bullshit. Uh, okay, that's another thing about how you look at different windows. And someone, naive... Is that, I'm sorry, is that the drop? The the, the 87 drop. So the number so is the drop, the percentage drop, the daily percentage? Yeah, daily percent, okay. But if you get the same, if you accumulate. And then, of course, you've got to extrapolate that line, okay? In a different direction, the whole method is you're not going to get the exact number, but understanding you extrapolate. You do this for rain in Houston, you get the same. Okay, uh, not necessarily Houston, any city in the United States. Houston, we get more rain, but this is pretty much the same shape. It's called the power law distribution. The power law distribution is whatever has in my graph in white. Okay, and within power laws, you have more or less fat-tailed. I think they're all within the same, uh, the same animal, okay? Uh, just a matter of degree. So, and then, th the blue line, okay, we have three ways to look at data. The first one is the idiotic way is use the Gaussian distribution and talk sigma. This you can't. Even economists who are clueless usually about anything, they put math, but they can't read their own math, all right? So even economists don't do it. So now we're fit, we have two methods left. Something called empirical distribution. What people did for Houston and stuff like that. What's an empirical distribution? It's a very simple way of taking past data, put the histogram, and say, okay, now we have a robust way to look at the properties without having to impart the probability distribution to it. May work very well in the center, but where do you miss the information? In the tails. Because by necessity, the empirical distribution is going to be bounded in the tail. So this is the empirical distribution for stock market. And what we have here in blue and uh, so on is different parameterization okay, of something called the power law. The previous graph. Okay, different parameterization. You can have you can disagree on this, okay, but on the parameterization, but the technique is to start ignoring, you take the data, you get a distribution, and extend the tail. So that's in a power law class, okay? And now, of course, how do we fit things? We start taking extremes. Say you take the rain, you take a period of time, and you start taking the extremes to see the maxima. Okay, you take a certain level, certain block, and you look at the maxima in the block. Or you put the threshold and only count observation above that threshold. Okay, this method is called block maxima. The other one is uh, peak over threshold. So, so 
the, 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 let's ignore the technique exact, uh, 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 but I look at the essence of the problem. The essence of the problem is you're looking at behavior of extremes and you're ready to extrapolate outside. Now if you apply that you may still say that the data in Houston shows some, something inconsistent with past statistics but you can only say that on the basis of doing the right metrics, not the wrong metrics, okay? So, this is where often it so happens that our grandmothers have a better instinct for this than professionals. <laughs> you see, because the way the brain works, somehow they get paranoid, okay, about some things. It is justified, I was going to see why, okay? So, the, uh, and then of course when I start looking at option price, people start thinking it's irrational for people to overpay so much for these probabilities. There's nothing irrational. That irrationality goes away. Another uh, person you got to take, and I took the works of a fellow called Taylor, Richard Taylor. Okay, he's a psychologist. He finds that we do a lot of stupid things in life, and thank God the government, he, uh, he and Kassin, want to nudge us in the right direction. Except they don't know what the fuck they're talking about with probability. <laughs> They don't understand a lot of things come that we think are behavior, all right, that are inconsistent with data, is perfectly consistent with data under a different class of distributions. Okay? So, so what now what I'm doing here, when you compare tail option prices, the, when you go in a tail, the empirical method underestimates tail events by 70, 70 times. <laughs> up to 70 times, so there's nothing irrational. <laughs> All right, it's just that these methods get very, very, very out of whack in the tails. Okay, so this is the first uh, uh, statement, okay. Now, inequality measure, same thing. Uh, discovered, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Discovered that Piketty method of inequality is also completely fucked up because the metric he used of taking, okay, I use our number on average that don't converge and even have a bias to them. So in other words, the rise in, in inequality is simply due to the fact that the property of the data is such that if you increase the sample size, the number goes up. That's it, or the sample space. It's just something. I published two papers on that, one uh, forthcoming and one uh, about when you take uh, measures of inequality by measuring inequality rather than measuring what you call from a back door the statistical distribution. Same thing with uh, with um, with the Pinker problem. With the Pinker problem, he's taking averages and taking averages. He said averages ha uh, average wars. To tell you why I think differently under fat tails, people have been very receptive, particularly in the military, when we introduced our critique of Pinker. Pinker said violence has dropped, and look, nothing has happened since the Second War, some stupid thing like that. We looked at the data, and we said, the inter-arrival time of these events, something like Second War, is something of the order of, uh, no, the order, it's uh, about 100 and some years, all right, depending on how severe the event. We did the block maxim by these techniques, and then we parameterized. There are, of course, some te technical things we had to bring but, but, but pretty much we realize how people make mistakes with, with, uh, by saying the average had changed because that's a claim about the average. And using facts, uh, journalistic fact checking is anecdotal. Science is not about what happened in your sample, whether the average have dro crime has dropped, is whether the true statistical mean has dropped. You see, because science is about ca what can be generalized outside your anecdote. Otherwise, it's just an anecdote. So you cannot generalize outside your sample. Okay, if, if you cannot make claim about tomorrow based on today, it means that your metric is not a statistical estimator. You see, that, that's the point. Say, violence has dropped. I mean, you know, we cannot assert that. Maybe it's true but not from the data, all right? So make the statement without data because the data you're showing and all these battery statistical tests fail statistical significance. You need more data for statistical significance on the fat tails. 
or but there's one interesting thing that there's a parameter of the shape of the distribution that is actually Gaussian <laughs> the alpha of the distribution is Gaussian so uh, it's inverse gamma which converges quickly to a Gaussian so that is you don't need a lot of sample to figure out that that, that uh, parameter so so let me continue the uh, a few things here we can say okay uh, sorry sorry go question about inequality measure yes does your critique apply to all existing measures well when the data it has a lot of inequality it's more acute you see so the estimator, the way to estimate inequality, if the data is generated by Pareto distribution or something log normal of, you know, with a high sigma, is as follows. If I average two countries, A and B, the, okay, the inequality, average inequality between two countries be lower than if I open up the country, both countries to one. The way that, so simply because the, 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 there are things that come with fat tails that mess up a lot of traditional measurements. So with the genie of, with the genie say, a genie of point, the true genie is point, uh, something like point uh, seven nine, uh, and you break up the world, you have a big sample, it's point seven, and you break it up in small ones, each one will be like point five nine. You see? And then you merge them, <laughs> You say, oh look, the inequality is higher today because you're putting all the data together as one. And also with time, as the number of the population number grows, the same effect happens, so, which is very uh, unsettling. So we did that for Gini or the, the what we call the, pers the, the percentile, like the top 1% owns 50%. If the top 1% really owns 70%, you're going to see in sample something like 60%. You're going to be off by 10. As with time, as your sample becomes large, you're going to see a rise towards 0.7. There's a bias and a pre-asymptotic bias. That's in, in, in both measures. But it applies to inequality in a lot of things. In financial inequality, economic uh, inequality, or um, inequality in the number of rain uh, on, uh, you know, uh, concentration of rain in Houston over a certain period. But when you start working with the plug-in estimators, you get a different result. Well, Eddie's yeah. question was whether this was inevitable for any measure, or there are measures that do better. Well, okay, the measure is wrong, but you don't see the mistake when inequality is small. You see, when, 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 when the Gini inequality is low, you don't see the mistake. You notice it when it's when it's high. Did I answer you? Is that the feature of all possible inequality measures, which is the no, all the ones that are based on using uh, averages. Averages. Okay, and not for for when the data is power law, your inequality measure using backdoor estimators. Yes, that's for all inequalities. Yes, and it's not uh, disproportionately high when the inequality is high. But you're using a measure of inequality that only works if, inequality, if there's no inequality then. You see the paradox. Someone may argue that maybe the measure works and when the inequality is small. I'll say this, you know, it's like a speedometer doesn't work if you're speeding. You get the idea. We didn't actually read the data. We just noticed that, the, I noticed that mistake in PKT and started doing things and noticed that few people knew about it. Yes? I just wanted to double check if the random variable is a fat tail, is, does that entail that its mean is undefined? I thought you might have said that earlier, no. but I want to double check. There are classes okay. in which there's a class in which kurtosis is undefined, or actually infinite. Its skewness is undefined. Okay. Its average is infinite. Uh, sorry, its mean is infinite. Undefined is when the variable can take, uh, uh, can be plus or minus negative, you know, or, uh, and, and when you square it, of course, it becomes infinite. Okay. So, so, depending on the context, different moments. Well, depending on parameterization. 
Okay. Okay. And there's something called a cubic alpha. The, 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 the distribution is at uh, uh, like that. You have probability of exceeding x. All right. The probability of exceeding x is going to be equal to something L of x, something called slowly moving function. Assume it's constant times x to the minus alpha. Okay. If that alpha is less than two, there's no variance. If alpha is one or less than one, uh, one or lower, there's no mean. Okay, so the uh, now there's something very interesting. If a distribution is fat-tailed, one-tailed, in other words, the, the 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 support is infinite on one side or, or blocked on one, then you're likely to have a bias that we can detect. You see the unfair relevance. I call it the Harvard problem because years ago I had a fight with two people at Harvard. One guy in insurance who took the average income of insurance companies right before Katrina, all right, and said, well, insurance companies make a lot of money. I said, no, you fucking idiot. You're taking the average. You don't do it that way, all right? But at the time, I didn't have the te technicity. I was still a trader, so I couldn't communicate in, with the math I communicate with now. So I was very impolite at the time, all right? And then there's a guy called Gary Pisano, where I wrote, the, okay, I call it, uh, uh, mistakes are always made by Harvard professors, so I always name them after one. So Gary Pisano looked at biotech companies and said, this is not good business. Why? Because they don't make a lot of money. I said, all you need is one of them to make tons of money, all right, for, for you to no longer be able to make that statement. And actually, you can see when I generate a Pareto distribution, which is one-tailed, you're going to see the average will always almost always be below. 93% of observation will be below the average. But 99%, you get the idea. So most observations, so you can figure out, okay? And when distribution is symmetric, it's both tails that are gonna be, measures of the tail are gonna be underestimating. So which is why when you take the rain in Houston, okay, you see the average is necessarily underestimated. <laughs> Because all you need is another torrent to, to change it, you see? Particularly when you take tail measure. But this we're sort of used to doing the, the corrective work heuristically. But, but um, the problem is, 15 years ago, what I'm saying would have made sense to a lot of people. Today, because a lot of people study statistics, okay, people make these mistakes. <laughs> Yes. You're saying that they, they kind of average things out. They just look at the average and they forget about the extreme events? No, no, I'm saying that the extreme, if the extreme can only happen one way, then there's a bias in your measurement of the average. Right. Pre asymptotically. Right. So, so take, all right, take a phenomenon like rain in Houston. All right? Right. If you miss the tail, you're going to underestimate the number. So, so if I generate artificial data replicating, you would see most of the time, you see you'd, you'd be below the average and once in a while you catch up and then it'd be below the average to catch up. So most of the time you have a bias, the bias, well necessarily think about it, low probability event are likely to not be on sample because you don't have a large enough sample. If I have 500 years of data, okay, will a thousand year uh, flood be there? No. Well, there we go. The probability of the tiny flood is less than 50%, all right? Yeah. All right, there we go. So this is exactly the, the, so this is the idea, is that if I say I have 50 years, I'm not going to get a 100-year flood in my 50 years of data. Th that's sort of how we work with it. So, so there is a bias, but the way we could, the, 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 the way I was going about it in the past is training, trying to alert people to a systematic way to think about fat tails looking at biases. It, it, so it was like completely, complete failure because nobody got my point. I wrote a whole book of Black Swan, sold millions of copies, and nobody got the point. That was my point. All right? When I started doing math, I put silent risk on the web. Then people got the point right away. <laughs> where, where all the myth about you popularize something to make it palatable, no, you make it more technical, people get it. Or they get it, or maybe they fake they get it because they see the derivation, then they're impressed. So if you Google me, silent risk on a web has all the 400 pages of that shit. All right? Or explaining, all right? So, yeah, go ahead. I want to say, Springer Verlong put out a book several years ago called Extreme Value Theory. I guess, you know, what they were talking about 
the flooding that happens in the Netherlands. Yes. I guess, I can't remember, something about extreme... Yeah, th there is a discipline called extreme value theory yeah. that I've been using as an argument for, for this. Right. Okay, so this but, is yes, value. but the thing is, the extreme value people, and I presented paper with them, and I socialized with them, the extreme value people deal with extreme values. Conditional, they don't deal with the mean. Right. You see the idea? Yeah. And, and so the, what I'm doing is trying to find a general technique method to deal with this without having to go through all the mathematics. Plus, extreme value isn't developed practically. It's very developed mathematically. Right. Well, they were trying to do New York University got flooded in Katrina. And I think they were talking about trying to build a wall or design the building to stand 33 feet of flooding at the medical Yeah, the, 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 the extreme value theory normally would recommend, would give you a recommendation to build much higher flood. But yeah. we don't transport that knowledge into other areas where they're not identified. Okay. I'm writing with a co-author a book on fat tails, okay, uh, uh, cannibalized from silent risk. And we realize there's no book on fat tails, explaining the logic. We call it the logic and statistics of fat tails. Extreme value theory actually is not always fat tails. It's what happens in the extremes, which is more sensitive to fat tails. And there are some problems with extreme value, of course, is that parameterization. So your theory is slightly different than, fat, than extreme value theory. No, no. Extreme va I deal with fat tails. How do you do with a world you don't understand? Right. Okay. Because fat tails mean you have more uncertainty about what you see. All right? They deal with extremes. Okay. Fat tails harm you in the extremes, and fat tail distribution tend to have their properties from the extreme. Okay. But extreme value theory deals with probabilities for extreme deviations. Okay. So, uh, any questions? And it's a, a relatively new extreme value theory. But I'm dealing with unexpected events, all right? So, uh, and I use, of course, a lot and was citing extreme value stuff and, and was now a contribution to pre-asymptotic. Extreme value theory deals with asymptotes. I deal pre-asymptotically, which is... So, let me continue now with um, pre-asymptotics for summons. So, Okay, extreme value theory also deals with when you adopt these two guys for the, for the extremes. I tried to work before the extremes. So the... Uh, by how slowly... So some of my work here, okay, I will skip quickly. By how slowly I have the distribution, okay, for Gaussian converges as square root of n, okay? And other, sorry, the mean converges at speed squ square root of n, okay? So, if I take, um, for example, if I double my observation, I get square root of two times a drop in variance. You agree? That's what happened. So I use that as a benchmark, pre-asymptotically, to look at what happens with different classes of distribution for a smaller sample to see locally how, how fat tail distribution is. Because these classifications that we have come for uh, uh, n infinity, not for, uh, you see, or n of one, all right? n of one or n of infinity. And here I look at intermediate values. So we notice, for example, that the, the, the student t, for example, is fatter tail, can be fatter tail than a, which has a variance can be fatter tailed than the distribution that doesn't have a variance based on a behavior of sums uh, and the exponent is not being true. This, this is technical, right? Uh, you guys don't seem to be into uh, Unless you want to stick to this, we can talk. This is pre asymptotic. This is what we're working on. So the. Uh, Okay, so I, I skipped this. So now, let's go back to classical risk theory. So the way go back to this is that I'm not interested in doing science. Science is a big part where all we all contribute. I'm interested in doing decision theory. Okay? And when you're trying to do decision theory, you have to look at the world slightly differently. Okay? You have to look at things because 
for example, let me give you an idea of why I'm not doing science. A pilot of a plane, okay, when you do something, you have a confidence scientific uh, thing. Use what? P-value of what? 3.05? All right. 0.01? Okay, with a p-value of 0.05, no pilot would be, ever be alive. <laughs> So we got to use something more stringent than for decision theory than what's so-called scientific. So let me start with classical risk theory. Okay, this is classical. Okay, so you guys uh, modernize it. Okay, modernize. Okay, and uh, now we're going to get to uh, the story of uh, ergodicity. If a hundred people. And, and, and we're going to, from that, get to a central problem of probability, all right? Before that, I was putting Kramer, but we're running out of time. How, till how long do we have? Uh, we can go quarter to seven. If, if okay. Uh, under fat tails, the problem of ruin, where you lose everything, is acute. There are conditions under which it doesn't happen under thin tails. Okay, this is a connection to ruin problems. Okay, uh, so let me now get into ruin problem. Why do you have to worry about extremes for ruin and on the fat tail? And let's think uh, uh, of this: a hundred people go to you guys in Jersey. Go to Atlantic City. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's say hundred people. You 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 f get hundred people on campus. You send them to Atlantic City. You want to figure out, you give them each a thousand bucks, the philosophy department here is rich, right? So you give them a thousand bucks each, and you tell them to gamble for two hours, X, five dollars at a time, put them in condition, and tell them, come back, you know, you come back at the, at the end of the experiment, a number of hours, all right? So you say, go and, you know, okay, now they come back, some of them bust, some of them non-bust, okay? So now we look at it, I have number 37 in the experiment is ruined. He lost everything. What happens to number 38? He's functioning, all right? So you can take, if you want to know how much the casinos make, or if there's a bug the casino has that allows you to make money, you average how much they made, all of them, okay? With and without the guy who was ruined. Okay, that's fine. Now let's say instead you send one person to the casino for a hundred days and day number 37 is ruined. What happens? Aha. Okay. Uh -huh. Now we have a problem. Because, so the probabilities you observe, called ensemble probability, do not match the time probability. We're in the presence of ruin. Okay. That's that's sort of like the fragility argument, but rephrased under something discovered by Peters and Galman, the way it's framed by Peters and Galman, okay? But I have it in 1997, to never cross a river, an average four feet deep. But I tell you, science is done by a lot of people putting little pieces together, and then you remerge them, all right? And I discovered Peters and Galman in 2016, all right? And the thing is as follows. En is the expectation of an ensemble of xi is always going to be higher than et of xi. All right. So in other words, the expectation of a gambler, if you send someone to Atlantic City, was probability one that person is going to be ruined, regardless of the alpha of the casino. If you send them at infinity. But if you send a group, they're going to get the alpha of the casino, positive or negative. So what people don't get is that if you have what I call uncle points, uncle points is you have to have a big loss, you pull out, you will never get the return of the market. You see, that, that's why the, the, you, over time you're not going to get the historical, even if they match one another. Okay, that's a problem of... Uh, physicists go on? Sorry? The, okay, so what happened to that Peters is that physicist, the Nobel guy, Gelman. Okay, Peters and Gelman 
I, we did a precautionary principle is avoid ruin, okay, because you can't continue. But we didn't frame it. Peters walks into Gelman, pre present the paper, and in, in the one hundredth of a second, Gelman got it, that everything done in probability from Bernoulli till today is wrong. <laughs> because the distribution over time is not the same as over space, <laughs> okay? But government immediately got it. I mean, like, at tens of, hundreds of a second. Peters came up with a problem. So they co-authored a bunch of papers, and the main one is uh, Peters and Galvan 2016, in which they show, they present the story the way I'm, I'm showing it, on sound versus time probability. The, the, the option traders all know about it. You have to avoid ruin. Warren Buffett, in order to get rich, you must survive. So there is a past dependence there, all right? You must first survive. So this is why you can't really, in, in Cool by Randomness, I had the metaphor of, it, you have a huge returns on, on Russian roulette that you never get, <laughs> you see? Because eventually you're going to blow your brain, all right? So, so you can't really compare processes unless you have some kind of transfer between the two functions. And those who got it are, those who got this point in the history of probability are uh, Kelly of Kelly Criterion, here in New Jersey guy, um, uh, Ed Torp of, you know, the gambler, uh, mathematician, the only mathematician, the first mathematician to get rich from gambling and trading. And of course, uh, the Shannon Entropy, the Shannon who did the entropy. The three of them worked together, all right? The three of them got it. And then of course, they didn't think about it in this term, but they solved that problem that way. And every trader solved that problem that way. There's risk you don't want to take, but your grandmother also. So now let's formalize how do we actually, uh, what comes out of it that, uh, so I've been, thanks to Twitter, on, in contact with both Harry and Peters, all right? Uh, and basically, the way it goes is as follows. If you're exposed to ruin in anything, it adds up. So if you have a small probability of ruin on a motorcycle, and you smoke, and you hang around the Soprano brothers, uh, Soprano Mafia guys, and stuff like that, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get, uh, you, you see the idea. So cumulatively, then it's probably one. So the way we solve this is as follows. You cannot extract the rationality of people or risk avoidance from a single event, single experiment, because they all add up. You see? Even financially, like if you do these experiments they do in psychology to figure out your risk aversion, okay, and how, how risk averse you are to lose $200, what if you have a car outside and you risk a meter parking meter? What if you have a, a pregnant girlfriend, or, or maybe a pregnant person? You have all these things that, that add up, all right, to your decision to avoid locally a single event. You cannot extract that, you see? So, hence, you, you, the, 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 a lot of stuff we say about probability is, is wrong. I wrote a chapter, it took me a year to write that chapter, from the math. The math took six minutes to write. It, it's it's, it's uh, on the web, it's called the Mathematical Foundation of Precautionary Principle. And revised it <laughs> after the, the paper by uh, Gallman, Peters and Gallman, which to me is probably the most important paper ever written in economics. The, the Gelman and Peters and Gelman, because the way they framed it. And the, the uh, which tells us, okay, that, that thing, that chapter, you can find it on Medium, it's chapter in my next book, it's called The Logic of Risk uh, Taking. And, and effectively, let's look now, how do you look at, uh, 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 let me ask you a question, all right? Is it rational to smoke? if you think you derive a small benefit from smoking, all right? So let's say, is it ir ir irrational to smoke a cigarette if the probability is very small of, of lung cancer, all right? And the pleasure I derive from smoking outweighs it enormously. In that cost-benefit analysis, is it rational to smoke? You may say yes, all right, for one cigarette, okay? But the problem is, we don't reason that way. We reason in the act of smoking. So your grandmother would not think in terms of one cigarette. She would not isolate that like 
in a psychology experiment, she would look at the act of smoking. It is irrational to smoke. It is rational to smoke a cigarette, you see? But the problem is, you, you and I know that nobody will ever smoke one cigarette, okay? Uh, and enjoy it, you see the idea? So, so it will be, people will smoke a lot of cigarettes, or, or not ever, but the tendency is, you gotta look at the cumulative act. So therefore, the way you gotta look at risk is in terms of exposure by how much it shortens your life expectancy. That's the way you gotta look at it. You're taking collection of risk, how much you're shortening your life expectancy, right? Which is bounded. And now we're gonna solve a philosophical problem that I'm trying to write a paper with a philosopher on it. But you know philosophers are hard to pin down, so sometimes they vanish. Uh, one of my co-authors actually, in Principle, did his PhD here. Uh, Rupert Reed? Rupert? Yeah. Did his PhD with me. With you? Uh, okay, all right. So, on a precautionary principle. Yeah, he's but part of that paper. Taking a big risk. Sorry? Taking a big risk. Who's taking a big risk? You. Why? We talk later. <laughs> by, by what? By mentioning him? All right. So, the, the, it's, it's recorded. Okay, so now he's, so he's our co author in the paper. Let me tell you, the best thing is you write a paper with a philosopher. Yeah, yeah. He's, but. It's be very good to write with a philosopher, a paper with a philosopher, because they're a pain in the neck, yeah. right? And the best thing you want to do is have someone pain in the neck, right? In, uh, it's like, you, you know that story of, uh, of the French expedition to the uh, Upper Egypt? Uh, and, and the order was, uh, so during the goal or something, they were sending, they said, Aswan, they said, okay, take one archaeologist, four hydrology engineers, this is this, and one philosopher, okay? A and they told him, a philosopher, why? He said he would have noticed the initial absence in the proposal of the archaeologist. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of like, <laughs> that's the only question is, he's gonna bug you with questions and once in a while be payoff, right? So, the, uh, the, the point of the precautionary principle for us is basically to try to frame it in points of in layering of risk. So let me come back to it. What's the worst case scenario that can happen? Uh, let me pick someone. Someone, uh, someone here is a student in economics? All right, so what's the worst thing that can happen to you? To me? I mean, for you, the worst thing that can happen for you, for you. Eternal torture? No, no, but other than that, yes, it for you. Be yeah. huh. So when you ask someone typically, what's the worst thing that can happen, and they say my uh, my death, no, the, your worst your worst case scenario, is it true that is your death the worst case scenario? No, eternal torture. Eternal torture. Okay, <laughs> but th that's the problem with philosophers; they mess up your argument. <laughs> All right. So the point uh, we, we look at it is as follows. You, but there's worst case scenario, not only you die, but the family, friends, and pets also die, all right? That's worse than you just dying, no? Forget the torture thing, with this philosophers are pain. Right? And then the tribe also dies. And then the self-defined extent, and the humanity dies, the ecosystem dies. So when we talk about life expectancy, I can have a shelf life that's okay, all right? I'm not gonna live more, I mean, 114 years is fine enough for me, all right? So reducing from that. But do you want the ecosystem to live only 114 years? Do you want humanity to survive only 114 years? No, you'd like these to stay a billion, all right? Several billion, all right? So the, if you start looking at layers, then you can understand a few things about precaution. That why is it that you guys, the Greeks, actually, we, but let's say you, or guy the Greeks, have as highest quality precaution and as highest quality also courage. Are they in conflict? Aha. Uh -huh. Then you understand you have the courage to kill yourself to save a higher layer. A Spartan, okay? For the sake of a higher layer. You always do it for the sake of a higher layer. Now you understand you reconcile that dying in order to extend the life of mankind or prevent mankind from, or the tribe, 
prevent the shortening of life of the tribe, then that becomes a measure. But the thing is, so what we're retaining from these is a bunch of things that are messed up, sort of, is that taking single event probability and judging your behavior on it is bullshit. And the second one, doing cost-benefit analysis here or here is also bullshit. I can't do cost-benefit analysis on Russian roulette, you see? Because eventually, if I play it, I'm going to die. You see? I, you can't say one off because then there'll be another one off. And eventually, your life expectancy is just, you know, 60 times. That's it. You have a 900% chance of dying uh, within a certain period. So this is where we have a problem in the framing of probability. Now, I, on, 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 I contacted, <laughs> we're talking to Peters. Is he just thought about it? Said, yeah, insurance companies. When 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 people evaluate insurance, you cannot evaluate insurance based on your insurance. You got to put it in context of all the other risks you're taking. Hence, when I do an experiment on you today, how much would you pay for this? I'm not extracting any information. <laughs> I need to know all the stream of risk you're going to be taking in the future, and I'm sure you don't. You, even you don't know. So, hence, some kind of paranoia about tail events is perfectly rational if you don't analyze it as paranoia about a single event but about a collection of future such events you see you want to we've survived I, I don't know if you how do you define mankind or humankind or whatever or mammals or okay between somewhere between half a, a million to uh, two three hundred million years no so we have developed a response to these events. So why do you want to fuck it up with some reasoning by bad statisticians? <laughs> okay, that is irrational to worry about Ebola. It's irrational to, to worry about uh, these tail events because you got to think of all the tail events. If you worry about all these tail events, not just one of them, that's the way. Okay. Now within you may say that isolated ones, but as a general policy, that no more than you can say. Okay, we don't judge people's rationality on smoking for one cigarette. When they put the warning on your uh, pack, they don't say, well, one cigarette is okay. All right, do they say that? No, they take the act of smoking. So we understand that. It's okay. So that's the second po problem with probability. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. Sorry? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so problem three, fragility. It's too complicated. It says that, that brings us to fragility, which also looks at the ruin as uh, things as a concave, that anything that is fragile has to have a concave reaction to disorder. But I, I, I can present fragility in two seconds and then stop there. No? and wrap up by, by talking about the three different okay let me try to explain fragility okay when I see this computer this computer is fragile yes it is fragile <sighs> hence it doesn't like randomness you see my point? Do you see a connection between the two? It doesn't like variability of the environment because it doesn't have upside. Just like your uh, trip to Greece doesn't like randomness. Any kind of information is likely to mess up your thing. Okay? It's not going to improve from shocks, but more than degrade. So, the thing we did mathematically, and, and that was not in literature, uh, we can find it is discover that things that are fragile are necessarily concave <laughs> to random events. They have to have this accelerated thing. So in other words, this one, an earthquake of magnitude 0.1 a thousand times is not going to harm it as much as an earthquake of magnitude 3 once. You see? So in other words, the same thing. I don't know about Greece, but if you jump 10 meters, I know about in Greece things, weird things happen. Let's say in, in, in Jersey, right? Tell me what happens to you. 
you die, no? Okay, but what if you jump 10 times one meter? You harm, if you jump one time 10 meter, you harm more than 10 times if you jump one meter, you agree? Well, that's, so we try to measure fragility based on that concavity of the exposure, not linearity. And there are things that are convex, things that are concave. <laughs> and, and, and I like this measure because it sort of wraps everything together in its in, in a policy of risk management. So this is sort of like the work I've been working, I mean I've been doing. I split my work between fat tails, which is what people can understand, and fragility which people don't understand. <laughs> And this leads to uh, policy. My first book, 1997, my first work, Dynamic Energy, I was still a trader, is on concave reactions, concavity and, and convexity. And you can apply it to probability. Probability is concave to error. <laughs> Con actually, because if you increase the uncertainty about your model, the probabilities go up when they're small. So tail probability, this is what explains why tail probabilities are higher under uncertainty. So, the, um, uh, so anything that has this shape is fragile, L locally, of course, you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, of course, when things break, they're no longer, when they break, they're no longer uh, uh, fragile, it's, it's broken, <laughs> right? And, and of, of course, anti-fragile is the opposite, things that are convex up to a point. So let me wrap up. So I started with the first problem of uh, fat tails by explaining that the consequences of fat tails are very severe. Uh, and then showing you a few tricks that how you don't observe the average. And uh, th but there have been pockets of people who've done great work, extreme value theory on understanding extremes. Nothing has been done on using you know non-extreme value theory, understanding regular, all right, how things behave. So there is an opening there. All right, for research, but also to discount statements made in real life. Okay, so this is uh, the an, an additional theory. This is fat tails. I know fat, fat tails as a trader because you know you sometimes you, you make all your money in one second, right? So the second uh, part of the lecture was uh, was about uh, errors people make, but because it, you can already know that if you're in fat tails that some statement you should avoid all right, about the mean, all right? you know, and you know which way the bias is. Then we moved into uh, that ergodicity. In other words, time probability cannot be derived from uh, ensemble probability except under some condition or using some kind of transformation. And, uh, and it's quite conse consequential. And from there I moved into my precautionary principle with your student. Okay, with, uh, with Rupert. So the, uh, actually, you know, argumentative students are, are good. He was very argumentative with our paper. So we, we, so we have a 19, uh, 2014 precaution principle on GMOs, why GMOs are not in the same class. To reconcile with fat tails, we explained that GMOs are not in the same class as uh, regular breeding. No more than jumping 10 meters, or, or you see, is the same class as jumping one meter. Okay, because of fragility. I tried to explain it in the paper. And we also explained that on the fat tails, the way you deal with the system is by breaking it up into independent uh, with circuit breakers so things don't spread like you do with epidemics and stuff like that. So this is some of the work on risk management. And finally, part three spoke about fragility as a way to approach uh, the problem. And uh, I have, hopefully I have a picture here of someone who, people who get the point of, uh, I got so many things that it's not uh, loading. Or maybe philosophy department PowerPoints work differently. Okay. Okay. So, but the, the uh, has a 13th century uh, treatise, Traité du Risque by a uh, uh, Pierre de Jean Olivier, a philosopher, scholastic philosopher, and 
Okay, I have to find the, the, the book, but it's incredible how people understood that to understand randomness, easy, it's easier to understand exposure than to understand randomness. Where is... Uh, this is uh, my work in the Incerto. Okay. Uh, how it touches all the different traditions about uncertainty. So how, for example, uh, extreme value theory is here, fat tail is here, there's an overlap, but there's no overlap between the literature on fat tail and skepticism. Okay, and you have, you have whole philosophical tradition on skepticism, all right? Okay, and you try to link them, all right? And how the other way, and then you can find this on the web anyway. The uh, and you can explain here uh, the fragility. Uh, trying to figure out contract theory. It's pretty much how you change your contract to make it, you know as a risk management tool. So collecting all of them in one one block, and now I have the books and there are technical papers. Every book has seven or eight technical papers, sort of like stemming from it. And the next one is called Skin in the Game. So volume five of the Incerto is on risk sharing in a, in, in a system. And then of course, stochastic processes don't overlap with convergence laws, don't overlap with this, don't overlap. So you try to put things together in looking at the research tradition by having different colors. Uh, mathematics is yellow, uh, legal theory is, uh, is uh, here. Uh, Decision theory is here, this color, and this color is philosophy. Uh, visibly, is a skeptical tradition in philosophy. I'm trying to put them together, trying to find links by, by trying to say, okay, there's nothing I think about I'm smart enough that someone else didn't think about. So let's find that person and try to see what context they thought about it. Okay? And I'll start thinking of contract theory. Just, uh, I kept going back in time. <laughs> See, how do people do insurance? Tell us Traité du Risque. A 13th century treatise on risk. <laughs> of, uh, Pierre de Jean Olivier. Olivier, a scholastic uh, uh, thing. I have it in, a, in a, it, it was reprinted in, um, in dual French and Latin. Uh, I don't know if you can get it in, in English. There's a fellow in a philosophy department uh, and mathematical de department who wrote a beautiful book on risk. Probably the only uh, person who really to get uh, the, the, the probability. Uh, his name is Franklin? James Franklin. Sorry? James Franklin. James Franklin, yes. And he mentions Olivier. Yeah. So, and, and then he started go, going. Because when you go back in time, you say it's so obvious that, that people have to understand these things, all right? And basically, all we have is that mathematical tradition of the die, that's not uncertainty. Uncertainty is much more structured, uh, less structured than that. So you gotta find ways to think about it. And hence anti-fragile, I wrote a whole anti-fragile based on that. F of X is your exposure to X is much more tractable and different animal than X. And how do you go convex transformation between one and the other? So, so here, the, the, so the, 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 the papers, of course, and then there's the, the, the end of the books, but this one is completely misunderstood, the black swan, and anti-fragile is m much more understood, maybe, maybe because it was not, you know, uh, people read you once, they buy, buy one of your books, so all the bullshitters bought the black swan and then buy it, so smarter people uh, bought anti-fragile, bought convexity. And how you can actually detect how something likes volatility from a local convexity. So we, we, have, uh, we have the convexity theorem. Simply from Jensen's inequality. So anyway, so, so I'm done. If you have questions. Uh yeah, no. well, we can oh, okay. All right, so. I have a simple question. Do you ever go against your common sense do you ever use the combination of all these insects to go against your common sense? Let me tell you one thing. Up, is it common sense to go against your common sense? It, 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 I think it's not common sense to go against. It's common sense to, it, is, it makes sense to question your common sense. 
but you've got to imagine that your common sense is not some random thing. It comes from a track record of survival. So you have to give some statistical respect to a property that survived a very large N in high dimensions, okay? Which is why you've got to be very careful when you discount, discount the rationality of religion, for example, or rationality of superstition, okay? Is that if you see no visible harm, maybe there's something behind it that maybe people who are superstitious have lower blood pressure you see so or, or maybe not but, but you cannot really take the, the cosmetic uh, thing root but, so you have all overridden say in your personal case your common sense uh, when I trade, I try to over yeah no when I, when I trade I override my common sense because I know that I, know that, that I had the wrong intuitions for uh, markets because we haven't traded for uh, billions of years, all right? We just started trading recently. So I, I knew that. And you do a protocol. And, and to lower, it also lowers your stress to have a protocol. You say, oh, I can't change the protocol. That's what the protocol is. I gotta change the protocol to change my de decision. So that way you can override. But, uh, but when it comes to tail events, from the beginning, every time I hear something, read something, it says, that tail events are overpriced probabilistically and never believe that shit. And then I got rich when I was a kid, or I was in my 20s, from a crash of 87, all right? And then I said, okay, all you need is if, if, if one event every some thousand years, all right, to discount that stuff, you gotta go with it. So, so my intuition there, I, I believe for, for tail events, my intuition was right. And all the reasoning was wrong. And today's continues. So sometimes what you think is wrong statistically is naive empiricism, like we saw with Ebola, makes profound sense when you switch to deeper classes of models. So yes, guess, sorry. I guess a follow-up question, how do you make that switch? Uh, the, the rule of thumb is, are you exposed to something, to a random variable, that was not in existence when you, for, when you built your intuitions? And this I explained in, in Food by Randomness. That for everything in my daily life, I go with my superstition. Except when it comes to trading. That's it. I, I'm very superstitious. Like I have a penny, I have a collect pennies, I have this. I got nothing to lose. And maybe it's good for my, it made me live longer. So it's nothing irrational. The, the, it's something that doesn't harm you, all right? I was curious about, I asked you before, before you started about Eli, uh, Eli Ayash. Eli Ayash. And you said you had, a, you were going to say something. Yeah, okay, no, uh, Eli detected the right thing. Uh, I, I don't quite understand his work, to be honest. But one thing I understand, I mean, I understand enough. One thing I, I understand is that we don't deal in probability. Probability is not a product. Probability is something that goes into an integral, all right? or a summation. It is a, a probability is a kernel. You gotta look at probability as a kernel, all right? So I have a chapter in Silent Risk that says how to use that kernel. It's never used raw because your payoff is not in probability except if you're buying a lottery ticket, you see? Or if you win a dollar or lose a dollar, it's in probability at the roulette table. But in real life, you have, you never have probability. You have a weird payoff function, you see? So probability is just a kernel of that weird payoff function. Yeah. Uh, someone, someone, okay, Food by Rams explained it very well. When one day there was a meeting like this and everybody was talking about the market and I said, the market's going up. The boss said, what do you think the market's going up? I raised my hand. And then he said, you fucking asshole. I see you short the market. You're lying at us, to us. Are, are you nuts or something? Or you, you caught right hand? I said, no, no, I think we should be short the market, but I think it's going higher. And why? I said, probability, you ask me the probability of the market going higher, it has a high probability of going up, but if it goes down, it will go down a lot more. So it has 30% probability of going down. You didn't ask me probability, but I don't trade on probability, I trade on payoff. So a small probability, so it's much more efficient to go short the market. So this is where expectation is what we deal with, not probability, you see? Yes? What do you say about classic kind of uh, probabilistic fallacies like conjunction fallacy and base rate fallacy? 
Base rate, okay. The base rate, there, there's, okay. Some people will always find examples to tell you uh, stuff like that. But let me let me take a few. Uh, uh, okay, an anti-fragile. I've taken a lot of these things by saying they're not uh, fallacies. All right. They're not fallacies. They're not fallacies. Like for example, but there's or the sounds of biases are not biases. Say hyperbolic discounting. Okay. Uh, people think that it's completely irrational to prefer. Uh, a massage uh, uh, today to two massages tomorrow, but not a massage in 365 days to two in 366 days. Okay, your, your time discount, but you don't realize that in real life you have to discount the fact that if that guy, in a richer model, if that guy is still around tomorrow, <laughs> It's for till around in a year that you have less risk. So you have to put the second source of what I call meta probability, distributed probability, make the primate. So what happens if you do that, a lot of the, the fallacies go away. What about the base rate? Well, it depends on your payoff, again, the base rate, because you also have to imagine that for taxi cabs, maybe it's wrong you know, to ignore the base rate. Like Harvard Medical School case. The, 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 uh, which Harvard Medical School? The, 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 okay, so that, that medical case is. I mean, I, I, for a period in my life, I believe that it was right, the, the AIDS based on a test. Yeah. But you never do random tests, you see? You never do random tests. Like, for example, there's something called the representativeness uh, determining the thing, or the same within the same classes. Is that is Joe an accountant or is he an English professor, all right? He's more likely to be an accountant than an English professor. But the, 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 you have to make sure that the behavior stemming from that leads you to trouble. So, w which is why I think I believe in making some mistakes. Making some mistakes may save your life. The only one, the one I discuss in anti-fragile is is adding a layer of probability to, for example, uh, mental accounting. Mental accounting is makes perfect sense. There is a fallacy say, called. Uh, the mental accounting fallacy, which say that the, how people gamble, if they make money, they gamble more, or they take more risk. They switch on, take more risk. And people think it's irrational. In fact, it is to restore ergodicity. Restore ergodicity, to avoid ruin. You have a different behavior when you're away from ruin. And actually, the trading strategies recommended by all the people who understand that, I think, are based on that rule. As you gamble with house money, with house money because then you don't have ruin problem. Another one about uh, the rationality of uh, violating the transitivity of preferences, for example, that makes perfect sense in, in, uh, in fragility, anti-fragile, I explain it in terms of if I don't want to deplete the environment, okay, it forces me to randomize my choices, so I don't always have tuna over something else. If, if I prefer A to B, B to C, but C to A, all right, you always supply things or okay, so that it voids that forces you to randomize your choices between C and A. You, you see? So it may be we're not talking about people, a lot of people come from social sciences why I have that story toolkit and try to say we're using physical metrics. If A is taller than B and B is taller than C, C cannot be taller than A. But but I never prefer A to B out of context. And also the, 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 I have repeated things. If I always pick A over B, all right, because it's, so it's a way for nature to cheat you into making you spread your preferences so you don't deplete something. So a lot of things go away if you ecologize them, what they call ecological rationality, or if you, uh, what I've done for the ecological rationality thing is this following um, a very simple uh, thing, which is, uh, Where's the picture of large world, small world? If you have another layer by making either sigma stochastic or something stochastic, then you bridge the small world. Uh, th there we go. So the idea that this is a large world, this is a small world. The savage is the representation. And then we do science here. But you can detect the bias between these two from by stochasticizing something. If I stochasticize your trip to Greece, then I realize that in the real world you're more likely to be delayed than, than 
you see, so it's no longer exact, you add the layer of stochasticity. So you add a layer of stochasticity for probability it rises. You add a layer of stochasticity to things that your preferences are no longer irrational if you violate transitivity. You see? Base rate, it's more complicated. I'll show you a couple of things about base rate, why they don't work on the fat tails. But then I wrote a paper with do idea that nobody understood. So we didn't publish it. We left it on SSRN. We get some Russian arguing with us once every uh, six months. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's about incompleteness and in decision making, where we say that you and I can have the same observations, but we have two different probability distributions. We'll never converge. So a lot of violations of base rate come from the fact that you have a different probability distribution than I do. If you think it's Cauchy, all right, <coughs> very simple. Typically, these Bayesian, these Bayesian things require Gaussianism because you're updating, so, so information has value when, when, when you add information. So if you are not updating that fast, you're not going to change your, your, your base rate. You're, sorry, you're not going to change your opinion. You're not going to update, no? You start with, say, an initial, uh, um, an initial uh, whatever you want to call it, an initial estimate, and then you're updating as you see data, all right? If I'm with a Cauchy, the mean is, sorry, close to Cauchy, the mean, but not Cauchy, the mean for me is 10, okay? I see data, my mean is not gonna change. But you're Gaussian, you start with a mean of 10, you see data, you quickly go to the mean of one, and I stay at 10, or go to 9.99, you see? So this is why you have to be very careful to see what probabilistic structure exists behind these things. You see, this is where fat tails matter. Just from an epistemological standpoint, information here is not worth as much information there. See, let me show you again for the base rate. What, why is slowness for the base rate? Uh, early, early on in a lecture, I showed the speed of large, large numbers, okay? And where the thing goes like this, and the other goes like this. If you go down like this and like this, we'll never meet. <laughs> See? Not in real time. So, of course, in a simple uh, uh, textbook explanation where uh, you have the data and known by everybody, yes. But, but outside, no. You need a structure to update. Which is why you've got to be very careful about some uh, probabilistic things. So errors by humans, to me, given that we've survived so long, got to be taken more seriously with a grain of salt. You see? <coughs> that maybe they're not errors. That's sort of like the, the gig a group, there are a lot of groups working on that. But my contribution is only on showing under that probability structure. Now, if you s default to fat tails, then a lot of these things cannot be made. A lot of statements about, for example, equity premium. The equity premium uh, d disappears on the fat tails. Are you in philosophy or statistics? Philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah, so a lot of things, you have to, to condition it on, so, I mean, the philosopher doesn't have to do statistical work, but a philosopher can say that under this structure here, if you're here and I'm here as a little assumption, okay, Who's more rigorous? Well, it's more rigorous to start here, go here, rather than start here and, and, and be harmed. And also when you make a, okay, let me give you a very simple example what I show that why you should be always where some paranoia or biases are fine. Stalin, when there was a 1936 thing, uh, after Lenin died, there was a Communist Party meeting and out of the say 800, about 200 voted against Stalin. What a confidence. Sorry? That was a mistake. That was, okay, so <laughs> Stalin went up and killed, how many did he kill? All, all the 200, sorry? 600. He killed the 800, <laughs> right? You see, I don't want to take a chance. I'm not in the business of, uh, I'm not in the business of trying to figure out, you know, the fairness, I'm in the business of survival, all right? So if you're in the business of survival, you don't want to be right. So in anti-fragile, have whole discussion, are we in the business of truth? Maybe in this department, in the afternoons, but in the morning, coming here, no. Coming here, you're in the business of survival. Once you get to the building, 
and you enter the building, then you're in a business of truth, you see? But if you're in a business of survival, of that's the idea, you see? So fragility is, an, uh, uh, say, you're changing from probabilistic to um, something else. Yes? I wanted to ask about the possible intersection between the fat tail stuff and the um, skepticism slash problem of induction. Exactly. Um, because, uh, think about it. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, like, I wonder how you would frame, like, I could imagine framing it one way, but, but I'm not sure you would like it, where it's just... Go ahead, frame um, it. You have some random variable, and, um, you know, you're an agent who wants to know, like, the probability that that random variable will take different values. Yes. Um, but here's the worry, like, you don't have enough, um, you don't know whether it's fat-tailed at, at the beginning, probably unless it's something like the amount of calories or something like that. Yeah. Um, and because of that, you, you know that your, uh, the individual's trial data that you get, yes. um, it will be difficult to sufficiently rule out the fat tail That's hypothesis exactly. in a okay. way that will give you yeah. kind of knowledge about that running variable. So I wrote, there's a student of Levi, Levi, of uh, Isaac Levi, Levi, called Avital Pilpel. When he was doing his PhD with Levi, with Levi, 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 Isaac Levi. So he was, uh, he came with exactly the same problem. Okay? And we had a Gedanken experiment where we're sitting down observing a random variable. All right? But behind the veil, someone was generating the data who knew the, the distribution, but you don't have access. You're only privy to the realization, not to the generator. What claims can you make about the generator? That's the, 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 the way he phrased it. This is why it's always good to work with philosophers, because again, he, they're pain in the neck, but rigorous, and they come up with ideas, questions, like we don't, okay, we have a generator there, so reality, you're not seeing the generator, you're seeing realization, okay, now. And of course, we linked it to the problem of induction, but let me, instead of delving into that paper, which you can find, you can Google it, Pilpel, uh, with Pilpel, Avital Pilpel, and, and you can find, it was actually published in Italian, of all places. Italians like that stuff. In, uh, in a Definetti type <laughs> thing. So, La Filosofia del Rischio. So they had a, you know, so they published it, okay. And, okay, we're very happy, it's only in Italian. But, the, but there's an English version. So, the, let me answer the, the, the problem of induction, to see it better. The whole business of statistics is as follows. What claims can you make, make of n plus 1 given n? No? That, that's business of statistics, no? So we put some structure on what claims you can make. Whereas the philosophers are the one who started the whole problem by saying you have no basis, you know, on n plus 1 based on n, all right? Or you have, or, or we doubt that you have, so, so you have really, the burden is on you to really convince me that what claims you can make n plus 1 on n. So statistics started as a, as, as a discipline. Unfortunately, the statistics started at two levels. One, about the mean, and two, in the Gaussian world, you see? And we're trying to do some work, okay, to correct for that, because technically for a philosopher, statistics should not exist, no? Because you doubt a link between n and n plus one, no? That's a Hume's problem of induction, all right? But now we say, okay, we're going to soften them up because we have an N is large and we have a technique. Okay, I buy your argument, you statistician, all right? That's, that's exactly the relationship, the tense relationship. Well, this is very weird that, that association you guys have because according to them, it shouldn't exist. And statisticians hate philosophers because they ask too many questions, all right? So, but, but now the problem of induction is exactly at the speed of induction for us is much lower under fat tail than under thin tail. This, this is how I came to it, all right? So therefore, I'm much more skeptical about, about claims made of the data under fat tail than under thin tail. That's simple, okay? As simple as that, you get it, no? Plus, the other thing people don't really get is that the statisticians have a measure. I, I, some people get, like, um, uh, Definetti gets it, What's his name gets it? Uh, Isaac Levi gets it. And he tells you that the degree of credence, all right, you have in something, all right, it's a, we have a thing in statistics called a variance for a thin-tailed. 
but the degree of credence is not a variance for fat tails. You see the, the, the point? It's much more refined. This is where, where you can link all these things together. How, how would what you just said change for long tails? Uh, uh, there's, uh, I mean, long tails same word as fat tails. Some oh, people right. say long tails for long memory of something. It's another another problem. Oh, I was thinking fat tails like it. There's a fatter chunk, and then long tails it goes down normally, but then it just. No, 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 no. This is, fat tail is not seen visually because what happens is fat tails have an observational way out there. It does the it becomes higher peak. So I, I'm going to have I'm probably going to put on a web chapters of the st the logic and statistics of fat tails where we discuss these things with um, Chirillo, I'm also a Twitter and a tw there's a Twitter probability uh, crowd with Chirillo who's my co-author for the the Pinker thing, and we're, I'm cannibalizing silent risk, and he's putting his stuff, he does extreme value theory, he's an extreme value theorist, and I'm a, a fat, fat tailed uh, skepticism type guy, and then we work with, the beauty of this is that the, the, the burden of the statistician, all right, is not to show you that there is pattern, but it's to make help the philosopher in his argument that that pattern is spurious. See, this is what people don't get about statistics. Statistics is not so much about making a statement, but the statistician is there to discipline a, a, a thing by saying that how much of anecdote is in your statement. How, how uh, you know, let's make your statement less anecdotal. This is a problem. So, and the, the way I put the layering is that you have the decision making required even more rigor than statistics because you want to survive because of that ergodicity problem. You see, so this is why the truth isn't as important as, as killing all of them. You see the idea? Is he doesn't really care which one voted. You, you want to, it's like avoiding some tail events. You know, life is long and you can find a lot of things, so you don't have to get in trouble. That's it. But in your behavior, people overweigh that. And, and you can see it, but sometimes it gets out of control. The other thing about common sense is that hurricane shit. How many people did it kill? Can it kill like Ebola? No, you should worry about Ebola more than hurricanes. But hurricanes are sensational, Donald Trump is going to go, they're going to take the picture of high heels of his, of his wife or something. So it becomes lurid, you see? Whereas Ebola is the most dangerous when it's silent. See, so, so sometimes also your reaction is to worry about hurricane because you see it on TV. So which is where the, the cut point. I don't trust my common sense if there's TV. But I trust my paranoia if it's communicated organically. By, uh, first of all, I don't watch TV. So by someone telling me stuff. So the, the and I've written about, about this, uh, in, uh, about the, the uh, if you hear about it in the Agora or you hear about it on TV, if you say, I heard about it on TV, I won't have heard about it in the Agora. Then ignore it. Okay, I think that's a okay, good great. place to stop. Uh, thank you very much.